Hello and welcome to Declassified, the classical music podcast created and hosted by me, Robert Guy. Today's episode comes from the home of Trafford Music Service at the Claremont Centre in Sale. Trafford is a Metropolitan District Council, one of ten in Greater Manchester. For those of you that listened to episode number one, you will know that my guests, Ewan, Jamie and Sim, brought up a number of interesting points about the current state of music education and the challenges they faced when choosing a career in music. So I wanted to explore this further with two experts. Ruth O'Keefe is the head of Trafford Music Service and she was my boss for nine years. I still pop in now and again to conduct a group or teach a violin lesson and Ruth's passion for music education is infectious and I believe will shine through in the conversation you're about to hear. Speaking personally, Ruth nurtured and developed my ability to connect and engage with young people. I'm also joined by Kate Blackstone. Kate and I were at the University of Manchester together as undergraduates and she's gone on to have a wonderfully diverse and rich career. She's a freelance musician, founder member of Kaleidoscope Orchestra, project manager for WICAT, otherwise known as Young Classical Artists Trust. She's a clarinet teacher at an independent school and she's worked for 10 years with Sefton Music Service as a woodwind tutor. She recently graduated from the University of Leeds after completing a doctorate investigating the career aspirations and transitions of conservatoire graduates. Two incredibly busy people passionate about music. So, let's go in and meet them. I'm head of Trafford's Music Service, which is a local authority music service. I'm Kate Blackstone. I'm a freelance musician, but actually that means that I spend a day a week working as a clarinet tutor in an independent school. I also work for Young Classical Artists Trust as their project manager for 21st century musicians, so I'm responsible for all of their career development work for graduating and early career musicians. And I'm also a freelance researcher uh, working on different projects, including a project with Merseyside Music Education Hub Alliance to um, raise students' awareness of their own uh, potential in the arts. Great, thank you. Well, I've, I've, I've asked Ruth and Kate to come today because Ruth gave me my first conducting job in 2009 when I came out of uni. And uh, I've known Kate since we were students at the university together as well, and you're a fantastic clarinetist and you're my brother, so I'm really grateful that you've come to chat to me on the podcast. So I want this episode to follow on from the first one, where I was chatting with three of my students at Manchester, and they said a few things which I thought could provoke some discussion today. The first thing that they all said was students felt everyone should have the right to an inspiring music education but felt growing up, when they were growing up, that you had to be talented to kind of make any progress quickly. And I wondered if you could talk to us about what you believe, Ruth, and what you promote at Trafford Music Service. Um, I would say that I don't believe that you can go into a classroom and and identify a talented musician and that those, those children are the ones that will... That, that will love music and will necessarily do lots of music you know I'm not sure that I believe in talent Um, I think that every absolutely every child has the potential to love music and for me if my teachers go into schools and the children that they're teaching love music as a result um, 
don't really care whether they're talented or not. I would love them to have um, have the opportunity to develop that talent and see what they could be. Um, we know that every child should be doing music. It's a national curriculum entitlement. Um, so every child should have a quality um, music provision within their school. We have government funding that says they should have additional opportunities to that. You know, the music education grant that, that English um, music clubs are able to draw down enables us to um, add to the offer that's in schools. So an inspiring music education, every child should have an aspir- inspiring music education. You know, it's like, for me, that's like saying, if you're not good at maths, what's the point in teaching it for the rest of your education? Yeah. Uh, so so it seems like a bizarre uh thought that's not to say that every child does have an inspiring music education and I think that's where there is a gap and that's where there's some work to do um what's it like in Trafford at the moment and I know that you might not be able to talk about specific schools or make reference but I know that when I was working for you you were determined to get into every single primary school I think there was only one that you weren't in and that you were looking to get into the you know, into the secondary school. What's what's the picture like after COVID with music education for? We do. School? We work with every single primary school in Trafford, and um, that has always is always been my mission. That um, I don't mind whether a primary school engages the music service to do music if they've got someone maybe maybe privately or that we work with them and they are delivering a really amazing music curriculum then I don't mind who who it is that does that the picture in Trafford I would say um, I'm really really proud of our schools I'm proud of their attitude to in, including music as part of a really important curriculum because remember we've got the grammar school so there can be a tendency not by the school but possibly by parents to feel that um, entrance exams are a priority um, and so so some boroughs I would say have a challenge where they um, they struggle to get children to continue with um, music education because of finance or because of other barriers whereas we have a lot of children that drop music in order to focus on entrance exams and to get into the grammar schools um, and the, my, my dream is that, that that no longer happens, that music is seen as equally as important, that children's musical development is recognised as being equally as important um, and that children can absolutely maintain doing music and having that um, change of uh, dedication during their, during their time and still go to grammar school if they want or not. Um, so the, the picture is really positive and after the pandemic we thought we had a reduction in numbers of children in our ensembles and we thought that and, and I wrote a plan for a rebuild um, but actually we have seen massive growth in terms of children and parents wanting their children to do music and it has been just a, a wonderful wonderful journey you know our ensembles are increasing on a weekly basis in terms of numbers that are joining us um, and they're going from strength to strength and, it, uh, and we're running a residential in a few weeks which I'm really excited about as well so um, so yeah it, it's a really positive picture in Trafford and of course we've got children coming in from Hong Kong who many of them are already quite accomplished musicians um, and so we are welcoming those children with open arms into our orchestras and into our um, instrumental lessons had uh, a couple of bassoonists, a couple of grade 8 French horns, a couple of oboe players over the last couple of months um, join our service. So That's amazing. It's been, I know that, the, <laughs> know that the other heads of service of the other great Manchester music services haven't seen such, um, such a lot of children come in, so they probably want to poke me in the eyes. But <laughs> Are these people that are fleeing Hong Kong because yes. of the political situation? Because of the political situation, yeah. And there's a growing community of um, children and families from Hong Kong in, in Trafford specifically. May, I don't know why, um, but um, it might be because we've got such amazing schools um, and I'd like to think because we've got an amazing music service as well um, that we've got these children coming in. So we're, we're really privileged and honoured to welcome mm-hmm. them to our music community. So why, why is there an assumption that a private school music education or we could say grammar school as well is better than 
a music service or a state music education? I think it's quite often to do with facilities, like sh shiny facilities. Like when I went for my interview at the independent school that I work at, um, I remember being showed around the department and a teacher saying to me, oh, well, we only have 20 practice rooms. And I was like, only 20? We have three at my school and one of them was a cupboard that I was frequently kicked out of. <laughs> um, so it, it was just, it, it, it blew my mind, the amount of facilities, and I guess it is about money, but I also know that just because you've got a shiny, and this is not me talking about the school that I work in because it's brill, but just because you've got a really shiny department and you're, uh, and you've paid for all of these expensive pianos and all the rest. Just facilities does not a good music department make. Mm. There's so much more than that. I saw something the other day when someone was talking about how sometimes state schools have to find that they need a thing. They need a thing. So, like, maybe this school is good for sport or this school is good for music or they've got a really good business studies department or whatever. Whereas private schools have a little bit more freedom to be good at more than one thing, loads of things. And then that, I think, is what breeds the attitude that then you're talking about, Rob, is that we have this, we have this situation where actually the students do loads of things. Sometimes at private schools, i found from my experience of teaching there, is the students now do so many things, too many things. They have to be the best at sport and the best at music and the best, at, and the best in, their, in their grades as well. And then it becomes this battle. And then it's like what you're saying, Ruth, about, well, we have to give something up. What's it going to be? music or am I going to give one thing up for the other well I've got to choose whereas in some schools you get a state school who's really good for sport or really good for music and maybe there's a bit more of an idea that you can nurture that because that can be your one path rather than too many paths mm. it's it I think it's complicated and I think it's not yeah I would I would think that it's not always true that your private school departments are automatically going to be better. Sure, they maybe got better facilities, but is it just that? I don't I think, think it is. Because people think they pay for it, they think it's automatically better. And I think it's always been a case of, well, what's actually going on inside? I mean, I went to a state school where there were two practice rooms, of which one of them was like a musical store cupboard. <laughs> yeah, and, right. <laughs> um, I was bullied terribly at school because I played boys' own, no matter what they tell you in the first day of school, because I could play the violin. And my parents only told me later in life that they encouraged me to play to football, so I could take a boot bag on the bus as well as a violin to try and not get bullied as much. But I, I just kind of I go back to what you were saying, Ruth. Like I think that it, it's just the opportunities that you're given, and very often the perceptions around it, isn't it? But everyone deserves that music education, no matter where you're from. And is the funding? Do we do we do you think we still need to kind of kind of make a case to Department of Education to show the benefits of everyone knows the benefits of sport and it's so well funded in schools. Have we not yet found the way of convincing politicians and the powers that be about the benefits of music are just as transformative? I think it's fair to say that we are blessed in this country to have Music Mark who campaign tirelessly to the Department for Education regarding the benefits of music and the fact that we still have a music education grant that um, is ring-fenced, it can't be given to authorities and local authorities say, fabulous, we'll use that for something else, it's ring-fenced for music. We've got a new national plan being, um, being uh, published hopefully by the end of March, fingers crossed. Um, and we've just had a model music curriculum. Um, so I would say that the messages are getting to the Department for Education and that there is still some work to do in terms of advocacy with, um, and this isn't in Trafford, but nationally, with head teachers in terms of um, the message that we're saying to parents about the importance of music. Um, I wouldn't say, I would say that we are, we're in a really, really positive position in terms of a national plan that's coming out. The, the fact that they've commissioned a national plan to be rewritten and that they've commissioned um, a model music curriculum so that as advocates for music we can say 
this is the entitlement look at what the children should have. Um, this is significantly um, an improvement upon, you know, when I came to Trafford Music Service, there was myself, a head of music service and a vocal specialist and an instrumental specialist. There was four of us. Um, and look at what we've achieved now. We've got 60 music service staff. We've got a, a management team of six um, we're working with every primary school in Trafford. We're working with um, our secondary schools, albeit lots of them still have the same setup that they had before, which was their private teachers, which is fine. They're doing a fantastic job, um, but they're communicating with us. They're supporting our orchestral setup. The journey that we've been on is huge, and my feeling is that it's only going to improve and the message is only going to get stronger and stronger. So I would say that the advocacy is there. And that is in no small part because of Music Mark and their role in the country. Do you think that... I've been, I've been just thinking about your first statement that you made about how you have to be talented in order to make progress. And the word progress keeps jumping out at me because I... I don't know, maybe you have a thought on this as well, Ruth, but do we only play music in order to make progress? Is music only worth doing if we're making measurable progress? I would say no, but that, I think that that attitude, that statement really, it, it really caught me because it said, well, it, it has an undertone of if you're not going to get better or not going to make progress quickly, then there's no point. Because we know that that's wrong. Music is so great for so many different reasons. And one of them is to get better and become really great at your instrument if that's what you want to do. But we know that's, that the value of music for like some kids goes beyond that. It's more about just being amongst friends or teamwork or becoming empathetic or just challenging yourself or just really liking music. You can be all of those things without making progress and of course we do use progress to measure if what we're doing is correct and that is very important but the idea that that's the only measure of whether it's worth it it kind of it doesn't sit right with me I think that that really jumped out at me yeah I mean something that um that I've experienced as a parent and not as a head of a music service is that it really is about frequency of doing that that instrument so my little boy Joel is eight he plays the French horn when he started I don't believe that he was any more talented than any other child that starts an instrument you know he wasn't a talented French horn player when he started blowing raspberries down his down his down his mouthpiece like he absolutely didn't have a musical talent he loved singing and and I, and I always used to say oh listen to him singing he sings so beautifully but and he started playing the French horn because I played the French horn not well, I have to say. I'm not a good French horn player, but <laughs> but that's why he chose that instrument. And he wasn't any he didn't have any raw talent, I would you know, I don't think that that, that was the case. But because I know that in order to make progress, you know, you say progress that they just need to do it regularly, he just did five minutes a day. He just did five minutes a day and the rate of his progress was just massive. And, you know, it wasn't because of any... I'm not saying his tutor wasn't an expert. It wasn't expert tutoring that was creating that. It wasn't the fact that I'm his mum and I run a music service. It, it was just that he was spending a little bit of time every day. And then he got to a point where he just loved it. So I don't think children just love it straight away. I think there is that gap, and I think that is the bit where perhaps if you're at a private school, there is that notion of you will do what you're instructed to do, and if you're instructed to do 10 minutes of practice, 20 minutes of practice every day, that's what you'll do. And then that little gap um, from nothing to loving it is quite quick. And perhaps there isn't that if we haven't educated parents and the people, you know, if we're not telling parents that this, this is the little bump that you need to get over to and then your child will totally love it. They'll love being able to get a piece of music out and play it. They'll love hearing something and saying, can you download that music for me so I can play it? It's that joy that comes, but I don't think it's necessarily there at the beginning. And that's that, I think, is the, 
role of an inspirational teacher is to get them over that first little bump to loving it and I don't believe that teachers in state schools are different from teachers in private schools in terms of how they can inspire a child at that very beginning point and um, Joel's teacher is a music service not Trafford music service a music service teacher who absolutely loves he absolutely loves he's like yes it's Friday he's going to go and see his teacher um, and, and I think it's that um, there are teachers that work in independent schools and state schools are they teaching better in the state school of course they're not <laughs> um, so, so yeah I, w- I would say it, it's absolutely all about the teacher and more even at the beginning about relationship between people that relationship between um, you know when I taught children because I did like a French horn thing we needed some French horns in the borough so I went out and did French horn things that was I went to some schools and said we need some French horns can I do some lessons um, and the the first six weeks or the first six months those children weren't playing the horn because they absolutely loved it they were playing the horn because I was building a really lovely relationship with them and we had a lovely time in our lessons and we talked about how amazing the horn is and how it's the best one and made them feel super special and it's that it's that love of your instrument and love of your teacher and love of that special time that you have with your teacher that I think really inspires children and then once you've done that that job they they then just continue to be inspired. So Joel just loves like he'll listen to a piece, he'll ask me to download the music, he'll learn it, and then he'll want everyone in the world to listen to it. Yeah. Um. And and he's he doesn't need inspiration yeah. necessarily, but it is that very beginning of the journey that I think is so important. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right as well. Like I. I don't just work, I do work at the independent school now only, but I was 10 years working for Sefton Music Service. So I know what it is to work for music service and I know what it is to work for lots of different schools in lots of different settings. And I can tell you that I teach the same at every single one of them and I might get different results, (laughs) but that's just the nature of students. All of them are different and actually you're right. It's more about meeting the student where they're at than anything else, than what facilities there are or who has what and who has raw talent which again I agree with you Ruth I think that it's less about talent and actually music psychologists we debate nature nurture all of the time and it always comes in the end down to nurture really it's more about how someone is brought up and taught than what natural talent I'm waving my fingers in the air has you know it, it it's been found that maybe talent isn't quite the same and the way that people conceptualise talent, especially as they get older, um, can sometimes depend on socioeconomic status, um, which I found really interesting when I was studying for my PhD. Um, So yeah, not always about talent. This is amazing, thank you. What is your magical music moment? Something that sticks with you that you just remember thinking, wow, I'm so proud of that, or I absolutely love that. What would your magical magical music moment be? I'm going to be rubbish and just refer to something that's happened really recently, which was our last music service concert at the Stoller Hall, which is amazing because it was our first concert after lockdown, and we were all like, oh! concert and then there was are they all going to be closed down no please god let them not be closed down but because i was a right at the beginning of december before there was all that oh my goodness are we going to not be able to have concerts and things because of the dreaded omicron so we got ours out of the way feeling very smug and happy that we did it but as part of that concert one of our oboe players from symphonia played with the philharmonic so we'll put uh, our symphonia is our second to top orchestra and our philharmonic is our top orchestra I did it to the symphonia you did you did so um so we had uh, a young lady who is in our symphonia who played gabriel's oboe with the philharmonic and i sat there and just was oh that's why i do my job there's loads of parts in my job that i just uh, on on exciting and to sit there and listen to her play that and just watch her and she had a beautiful dress on and 
I can just imagine how her family were feeling. So that was just like hairs on the, nice. on my arms minute. Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, so when I'm not doing my job, one of the things that I also do is I'm quite involved with a group of amateur musicians who meet at weekends and sometimes over the summer. And so recently I've been organising some of the courses that they run, um, which includes um, two 10-day um, like main courses that we do in the middle of summer. And naturally our 2020 course got completely cancelled and that was one that myself and a friend were meant to be organising. And so we pulled that with regret. And then we managed to just about go ahead in 2021 with this course um, and it was it, it was something that even three days before we were thinking should we pull this so if you to put into context when it was it was after freedom day in inverted commas but there was all this stuff about the delta variant that was really on the rise at that time and we were like is it wise to bring together what's going to be 120 musicians from several different parts of the UK is this a really terrible idea and we did go ahead we had a daily testing regime nobody got covid and it was amazing and yeah it was just so incredible to play music together again and these are people who some of them do play music as a living some of them work in music but don't necessarily play for a living and some people do completely different jobs but also enjoy playing music and this is a group of people for whom music is a massive part of their life even if they did not become a musician completely and it just reminded me that the reason why we play music is ultimately just to be together and to be part of something and that's what I try to remind myself even when I'm teaching but yeah it was incredible I'm not a crier really but actually, uh, like, I do cry. <laughs> Generally, I cry when I feel sorry for myself, which is terrible, isn't it? But actually, we, um, we just did this one evening where the choir sang and then we played a thing. And I was just in bits. It was just so nice to see people together again and play some beautiful music. And it, it was a moment for me where I had a really profound, profound sense of what was lost during the pandemic, all that time that we'd spent not doing those things actually really brought it home, how important it is to me just to to play. And I guess I'm in a privileged position to say that, but it's so nice to be able to get people together. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your research you know you've been speaking a lot about students who are studying music and careers mm -hmm. and the challenges that they face and the perceptions around studying music at a degree if you could just tell us what your research was about because some of my students were saying that they were told at school if you're good at anything else go and do that don't go and study music go and do a proper subject go and earn a living go and be secure financially, or almost encouraged to go and do anything else but music. Yeah, I mean, that's a really common thing still, isn't it? And, yeah, the research work that I do now, um, well, I suppose, if we start at the beginning, I did a Masters in Music Psychology, and at the time I was just really interested in students and how they learn and how do we become good at an instrument and why does someone pick it up? more than others quicker and all of that different stuff and then I got onto the nature nurture debate and then and then from there I started thinking about my own journey because I have a friend who jokes that everybody um, uses their PhD to sort of uh, get rid of some of their angst from their from their earlier life <laughs> so I started thinking about my own journey and I thought about us as musicians and what we do all day and how lots of people really don't understand what it is that musicians do what do how do we use music in our lives? How do people study music and then go on to other things? It fascinated me that even I, a musician, only really knew about the famous people, the people who made it, in inverted commas. But then, actually, I looked around at myself and all my friends, and all of us are very happily working in music, doing a whole load of different things. And I thought, so where did I get this idea from that I only make it if... I'm playing with the BBC film, or if I'm a soloist here or there, or whatever. And so, yeah, I applied to study a PhD, and that was to work out 
<laughs> workout makes it sound like it's finished, um, but to sort of explore the way that, mus that musicians build their careers after leaving music college and what that process is like, because I remember it being quite, quite difficult, just quite difficult emotionally and mentally as well as actually just the nuts and bolts of it, the finding work, the, the earning money and all of that different stuff. So that was where I started. I wanted to know about musicians' careers and I wanted to know what like, I hate to use the word normal or regular, but regular gigging musicians do all day. You can be extremely successful, but you won't be famous. And I wanted to know about those people and how, how they got there. So um, that's where it started. But since then, I have been working for Young Classical Artists Trust, working on their career development stuff that is for all musicians, not just the selected solo artists, but for everybody. Um, and I've also been working on... Um, a project called Merseyside Creative Futures, which is for students in the Liverpool city region and where we're trying to show what real people do with music, not just music degrees, but with arts degrees and how they work in music in the Liverpool city region. Because one of the things that struck me, again, is that quite a lot of students, especially, I don't want to play the poor northerner card, but you read about a lot of people who went to these big private schools in the home counties and quite a lot of people and students in Liverpool especially which is you know quite a deprived area in some places look at that and they think that will never be me that will never be me how do I become how do I become that and how do I do this and actually one of the things that really struck me about what I did is I made these fact sheets for these students where I interviewed real people who work in the arts um, and one thing that really struck me is when I asked them about their qualifications all of them said oh, well, I do have the qualification, but really it was about the skills that I've got and that's what gets me hired. And it made me realise that sometimes we focus so hard on the idea that qualification is the, is the key to the door when it comes to becoming a musician or getting a job in music, but actually it's about all of those skills that we develop from the very beginning, the, the instrumental skills, sure, but the, the skills of self-promotion, Working with other people is a massive one. Adaptability, diary management, all of those things as well. Um, and it just got me thinking about whether we've got it a bit turned round. I don't know if that answers your question, mm. but yeah, then what you were saying about you could do anything else apart from music. I think that sometimes people that give that advice, to be careful how I say this, sometimes people that give that advice don't really have a great idea about how people make money in the arts. I think that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to shine a light on this is what people do in the arts. It's a massive industry. It's one of our biggest export industries, yet for some reason we're trying to turn people off doing this career. And I think it's because, especially when I was a student, and I don't know if you encounter people like this, Ruth, but when I was a student, I definitely thought that my two career paths were musician or teacher <laughs> and if I was a teacher I was definitely a failure and that was because I couldn't play and now I know that that is not true it's absolutely not true I'm a musician and I am a teacher and that's really a big core part of what I do and it's really super important that I am in touch with my instrument and that makes me a good teacher but being a good teacher makes me good at my instrument and why wouldn't I want to share that skill and it's a really core part of what I do um, but it made me realise that I just had really no idea about what it was to be a musician and what I would do. And I think quite a lot of the time there's this myth that there are no jobs in music. There are no jobs, don't bother. And so I think that's how that advice keeps on going. Mm. And then I posed a question on Twitter about this advice just because it was on my mind. And so I put it on Twitter and said, was anyone else advised to do anything else apart from music? I had 70 replies. Um, and lots of people said yes, it was really unhelpful, but some people said it was really helpful to them because it made them realise that they did really want to do it anyway, mm. that I wasn't going to listen to them, and which was really interesting because, yeah, I do wonder if we could be equipping our students at all levels, not just... I was learning about graduates and about conservatoire students when I did my research, but now when I'm thinking about... I'm thinking about the whole conveyor belt, as you put it, at, could we just be giving better advice to all these musicians from the very start? And I think we could. And I think it's just about knowing what actually do musicians do and how do they make their money and being super, super um, honest about it. At university and conservatoire, they celebrate, and it's what is seen as success is 
conducting the BBC Philharmonic or playing in the London Symphony Orchestra or whatever, those kind of high powered performance getting onto White Cat. Oh, they yeah. don't they don't they don't celebrate and they don't show where ninety nine percent of musicians go is into that pool of freelance and doing this and that and doing all kinds of different things, but that isn't almost kind of put on the front cover as success. Again, it's like the most talented are the most successful. It's the perception of that again. And, and it annoys me when some of my students say, oh, I'm graduating this summer, and oh my goodness, how am I going to earn a living? Do you think I can do some teaching? It's like, well, do you like teaching? Do you, do you want to teach? Because teaching is not easy. <laughs> oh, no. I might just go and do a PGC. Oh, I might just write a letter to the music services in Manchester and, and just say, you know, can you give me some work? And I'm like, well, I know these people, but, you know, like, they're going to see straight through that. Teaching music is not something that's second best because you maybe had other ideas. Do you want to say anything on that, really? You know? Yeah, so so we changed our recruitment process so that we make it very, very clear that when people come and work for Trafford Music Service, if they commit to our children and they commit a Monday morning, a Monday afternoon or a Wednesday evening, whatever they tell us they are committing to those children, that that commitment has to be, um, has to be kept um, because... I when I started in this job, you know, seventeen years ago maybe, um, I didn't really I didn't go to music college, so I'm not an RNCM um, graduate, so I hadn't realised that 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 there was this thing of um, come out of college, I haven't quite got enough performing work, so I'll just do a bit of teaching, and when I realised that, I was so horrified. Because our children deserve teachers who want to be there that aren't doing it because 100%. because because they've not quite got enough gig work to make the week up. They deserve to have children, to have teachers who are wanting the best for them, wanting to inspire them. Absolutely, they can be players. You know, Rob, you worked for us for absolutely ages, didn't you? You you taught for us on a Saturday morning. Um, you conducted for us. Um, and and we had the conversation around um, when can we best put your teaching work so that it doesn't impact on your ability to develop the rest of your career that you wanted to do. And we have that conversation with our teachers. And don't get me wrong, if someone is committed to their children and then an amazing opportunity comes up, we, we absolutely want the best for our staff. So we will move heaven and earth to make it so that they can be an amazing teacher and be a committed teacher, but also follow another uh, another love, whatever that is. Um, but the whole idea that we'll do a bit of teaching just to just to mop up a Monday morning because we've got no, uh, we've got a bit of a, a bit of time is just. It's really easy to see on applications um, when people apply that they're not really interested. And it's really easy to see in interviews. You know, when people come and interview and you can see that they just, they're not even, they don't even like children. <laughs> you, you, wonder, you wonder why they're sat there like honking on a trumpet or whatever it is with some beginner children doing a demonstration lesson in order to come and work for us when they they don't seem like they have any affinity or love of being with children at all so um yeah I do have a view on it and I know there is this conversation around we are different to other music services in that some music services believe that the that by having professional musicians teaching it's worth it to for for them to put in depth some things so they'll say it's fine you don't you don't need to commit every week you can put depths in whenever you want because it's worth it to have a professional musician teaching children but do you know we at the point of starting a child off it, it is all about relationship and what does it say to a child if every third week you're not there because something is more important than inspiring them? And what so, does it say to the parents? Yeah. And what does it say to that child who's already thinking maybe, oh, I want to become a, I want to become a musician, and then they'll remember their previous teacher well. My teacher used to every two weeks used to dep out, so that shows that teaching's not as important as playing. 
and then the cycle continues. Yeah. This is why I learned so much from working for you because you transformed Traffic Music Service in the time that I was with you. And I remember you always showed me a video about, I think it was about a bee. It was the it was the September training music service, and there was a video, and it basically you were showing us a video to make us realise that every child is different, and if it's not working in the way that you're delivering it, look at yourself to ask yourself, what can I change in my delivery to try and help make that connection? And there was something about a bumblebee flying around. I think, was it to do with trying to ask a bumblebee to climb a tree or something? And that's if it. Yeah, are you trying to ask them to do something that's, that's not within their, their power to do? Yeah, yeah. Just to sort of start to wrap this up, um, I ask everyone, what is their musical recommendation? A piece of music that you're listening to at the moment, or a piece that maybe nobody might not know, what would your musical recommendation be? You can have a couple bit of time. <laughs> well, I've got small children in my house, so we have a number of things that are baby always... Shark. No, I'm not going to say Baby Shark, goodness. <laughs> um, but there's, there's... I mean, if you're thinking about... When you think about what... what the children's experience of music is um you know we myself um and my, and my husband and joel we went to the halle um to watch the john williams concert a few weeks ago and um star wars jewel of the fates i turned and looked at their faces when the choir came in and it was something to behold and you forget having had a whole lifetime of listening to a range of classical music you forget that for people who don't regularly listen to classical music to hear something like that um, and for children who will have you know he's eight years old he might have had he might, he's had three years of putting stuff on Alexa he's not got anywhere just to remember I suppose when when you're working with children to expose them to stuff that you might think oh yeah they'll have heard that a million times they absolutely haven't um, so Jewel of the Fates so we, we watched that we, we went to the Halle we came back it's been on every morning in breakfast and Jonathan who's three my little Jonathan he loves um, Hall of the Mountain King so <laughs> he goes Alexa play Hall of the Mountain King and then he sits there and waits for it to get faster at the breakfast table so um, that really brings us joy in our house so I would say don't, don't underestimate the joy of things that are, are really popular and you might think that people have heard but actually yeah. they might not have done yeah, I was going to say what never fails to give me a lift if I'm having like a bit of a bad day is, and I did this one one night actually and ended up, up really late watching YouTube videos just YouTube live videos of Elton John from the 80s and the 70s. <laughs> They're so good. Uh, the, li the live egg thing with um, George Michael when they'd sing Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me is incredible as well. Just all those videos are just like so much so much energy and passion and like he could really play and he could really sing and some of that songwriting is incredible as well just the whole the whole thing i just i just listen to it and i'm like all oh, right what's the next one what's the next one you end up like in this hole of just watching more and more videos but it's one of those things that never fails to just yeah just really just really improve my day The audience is quite broad for declassified, but they, there's going to be students, there's, there could be parents. It's quite a, a general question, but what would your advice be to, based on what we've been talking about today? If you had, if you could sit someone down and say, look, this is what I would say to you. To would students, I would say, if you think you might want to teach, go and be with a music service or be with a teacher before you graduate. Just contact us and say can I come can I come and see what goes on come and feel what it feels like to be in a music center with children at the very beginning of their musical journey and see if that brings you joy because if it doesn't don't do it <laughs> but if it does if you get there and think oh wow this is amazing then just being in that situation and experiencing how teachers work experiencing how junior and remember that 
that where you are in your journey is so far away now from the beginning don't presume you will remember how to start someone at the beginning of their journey you absolutely need to see how that is done because it requires really preparation and planning and looking at um and looking at how best to engage every single child so go and see what the professional teachers do and to try to tackle that at manchester this year i've done a course that they have there conducting one for conducting choirs and orchestras but obviously everyone at uni can play so I've done a to try and help people go more into if they're thinking about going to music service or want to work with community choirs or want to work in um, you know prisons doing music making like that kind of more community level I say right we'll do a different course but everyone has to play their third or fourth study <laughs> to try to replicate to try okay right now that's people to teach, that's great, I'll do it. And the luck on some of their first faces on their faces in the first few weeks was like, but so, now do your job. And I think it's been a really good beneficial lesson because you know they just as you say, they're so at, at university or conservatory, you are so far removed from where you were twenty, eighteen, about well, fifteen years ago maybe. So okay, I interrupted, what was yours gonna be? Oh no, it's fine. Um actually mine is basically what you were going to say, Ruth, but like uh, on a on a wider basis. My thing that I always say to any students or graduates is, you wouldn't buy a coat without trying it on. And the same goes for careers. Like when Ruth was saying, go and see how it feels to be a teacher. You must go and try all of these things. Lots of people that I met throughout what I do now, they write off certain careers because they think they wouldn't like it. Um, and they're wrong, <laughs> they surprise themselves later on, or they think they want to do a thing until they actually go and experience it. And the likelihood is, if you are a student, you have two playing experiences in the main, which are preparing for a recital and doing orchestral music. So those are the only coats that you've tried on, orchestral musician, soloist. Go and try some more coats on, because later on you might find that the one that you thought looked really good on you actually doesn't fit as well as you thought. And we've all worn that one thing maybe that other people tell us, us looks good on us, but we don't know, but they don't know that actually it pinches on the arms a bit. And that's Often we end up in career roles sometimes which look good to the outside viewer but actually don't feel right. So don't be afraid to just try loads of things and see what fits because there is something for you. Yeah. And um, do what brings you joy. Yeah. You know, it's a long time. Your working career is a long time. And what I would say is that this job that I'm doing now, it brings me joy every day. I love it. And I, I don't know that... All the tea in China could ask, could I would want to do something else, and to have that as your job is amazing. So have that aspiration for yourself. Don't do what you think other people think is a great job or has is prestigious or any of those things. Just um, do what brings you joy. I'm totally nicking that analogy, by the way. <laughs> I need to copyright this. I use it quite often, but I need to start. Um, I, I need to write, maybe I'm just going to write a blog on it. I've done it before. Because then Sue Rob, <laughs> when you hear yeah. him using it on his course content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can take it a lot, you can take it a lot further though. You know, it's okay if a coat wears out. It's okay if you decide you don't like it anymore. Sometimes things that look awful on the hanger look great on you. So keep and when trying. You're, and when you're at university or in a college, you're still growing yourself. You, yep. know, you think that you know everything about the world and you can take everything on and then... Ten years later, you realise how stupid you were. Oh, I thought I was so badass when I was at university. <laughs> but actually, you, you, your teacher only cares about you. But sometimes, what they want for you isn't it, it, it's not doesn't feel comfortable, as you say. Yeah. last thing is game time. Say the first, I'll give you two options. Say the first thing that comes to your mind. I think some of these um, should be quite funny. So the first one is Manchester or London? Manchester. Manchester. Okay. Every day. <laughs> Sorry to my job in London, Manchester. <laughs> Second one is solo or ensemble? Ensemble. Okay. <laughs> Third one is mainstream or niche? Mainstream. Niche? I don't know. And the last one was conductor or no conductor? No conductor. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Ooh, conductor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
My thanks go to two brilliant guests, Ruth O'Keefe and Kate Blackstone. Thanks also to Andrew Griffiths, our editor, James Hedgecock, our production manager, and to John Guy, the composer of Vision of Fire, which is the piece of music you hear throughout the episode. If you're free on the 9th of April, I'm conducting New Sinfonia and New Voices at a gig at T-Paub in Wrexham. It's called Hiraith, which is Welsh for longing for home. And we're going to be exploring that topic through music. It would be great to see you there. And tickets are available via www.newsinfonia.org.uk. Until then, thanks for listening and bye bye. <laughs>